Hello? Kate Gale? Are we live now? So I'm going to start over as though you just joined me for this moment. So here we go. Welcome, gentle listeners. Good evening. Welcome to the Red Hen Press Poetry Hour in this second week of the Broad Stage's new series, The Broad Stage at Home. I'm your host, Sandra Singh Lo, with my pandemic week three hair, my bandana, and this is my messy living room with some mood lighting. And we're streaming to you now via Facebook Live. So feel free to share your thoughts in the comments section as we go along, and we'll try to weave them into the conversation. Our distinguished panelists for act one of this one hour show are Kate Gale, co-founder and managing editor of Red Hen Press. Hey, Kate, looking good, looking well lit and good. Next, we have Rob Bayless, artistic and executive director of the Broad Stage. Hey Hi. there, nice blazer this week. Yes, you're, you're getting neater and I'm looking more unkempt. And may we finally welcome our featured poet for this evening, Major Jackson. Just as a quick bio, Major Jackson's work has appeared in the New Yorker, Paris Review, American Poetry Review. He's a winner of a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, Pushcart Prize, Whiting Writers Award. He's edited Best American Poetry 2019, is poetry editor of Harvard Review. His five volumes of poetry include Roll Deep, Leaving Saturn, and now from Double W. Norton, best publisher on earth, the absurd man. Major is a professor at the University of Vermont, a distinguished professor, and heartfelt thanks because Major comes to us tonight from his home in South Burlington, where mm -hmm. it is, in fact, 11.04 at night. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Now, before I turn it over to our panel for their opening thoughts, you know, we think a lot about what to bring you this hour. I mean, the times are so uh, they're they're crushing. They're and and every day in the paper, it, it is difficult to even just get through the first section. There's so much horror and tragedy for so many. Um, that's it. We we're trying to find a balance in this hour because it is Saturday night at eight. So we like to be with you. We like to show what poetry can do to enliven all of our humanity, strengthen our spirits, and give us hope as we go forth. So we 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 will acknowledge and our hearts go out to everybody who's suffering right now, but we also want to acknowledge people that are at home and that are sometimes you're so frustrated because you can't do anything. Um, but the best we can do is to not get cabin fever as we stay in quarantine. So we try to give you a bit of a reason to be at home. And that's why before I turn it over to the panel, the two questions I'm going to ask them is first that Ralph Waldo Emerson question of what has become clear to you since last we met, we just talked yesterday. And the second, or it could be in any order panel, is what is your wine pairing, your poetry wine pairing tonight? Mine this evening. So last week, because I like it's poetry, it's a dark time, I gotta go with red wine, I gotta not seem lightweight. But this week, inspired by a poem that Major is going to read called Cocoa Beach, I thought it was okay to uncork my inner Florida for a moment in these dark times. So I went to my friend, Joe Capella at Everson Royce, my wine sommelier, and he suggested this rosé, pool party. Okay, from central <laughs> California. And that's what I, and I, I needed, like a, not a screw top because we're trying to keep a civilization here. So I'm gonna uncork it and I'm gonna pair it with cheese. So anything that you guys at home are enjoying, please feel free to put it on our comments section. And now as I uncork, I turn to you, I uncork first, Gail. What has become clear to you since we met? What wine will be, you be enjoying later? Tell us. Um, well, I, I have been thinking about everything that's happening in New York and Detroit and in Louisiana. And um, I, my prayers go out to all, all of you who have lost someone. I think that, um, Poetry is what keeps us going though during this time. And that's part of the reason we want to bring you poetry. Um, Red Hen is now a press that publishes poetry and prose, but poetry is what built this city. Poetry is what I fell in love with first. And to me, poetry is the core part of the language. And so I'm so happy that poetry is so important to Rob that he wanted us to have this partnership and bring you poetry each week. And I hope that entering this room of poetry 
which for me is the cathedral of the soul, will make you feel like you've entered a better place at the end of each of these poetry hours. Um, so thank you all for being with us. Thank Rob. you. Thank you. Um, maybe the thing that, that struck me the most this week is that since last week, we've now done this once before. So there's something really great growing and blooming here. And I think it's an incredibly encouraging moment um, as we learn to bring this to you and work together to make it happen. Um, there's also been an outpouring of support from artists all over the country wanting to help with this and be a part of it. And um, I want to thank everyone who's who's here with us for this incredible show tonight, and most especially uh, Major Jackson is joining us now. Um, and it's it's just been wonderful to see that the platform really has meaning for people, and and I think is bringing some solace at a very complicated time. Um, maybe the other thing that's really switched for me is that I think in the earliest weeks of all of this, like like many of you, I, I was really struggling with when do we get to go back? Um, you know, when do, I, when do I get to have something that I knew, um, you know, again, and, and with that familiarity and with that, that joy and, and that welcome embrace. And I think maybe something that occurred for me and, and Kate, to your point, probably stemming from the extraordinary loss of life that we're now seeing is that we, we will emerge from this and we will emerge from it transformed and powerful, but we're not going back. Um, we, that, that landscape is transfigured. And I think for me, that really settled in this week that where we're going now is, is straight ahead. So it's not for us to be thinking maybe a little differently about that, or at least in my case. And I think the last thing um, I've noticed is that, at least in my neighborhood, people are really being nice to each other. So when people are out on the street, we're staying so far away from each other. I have a dog, so I'm not walking my dog. And, you know, we, we steer clear. We're saying hello from across the sidewalk. Many people sitting on their porches and they're not approaching the fence, but if you wave, you'll get a hello. And I feel like that's incredibly encouraging. So that's helped me to break up the, uh, the monotony of some of this and to stay encouraged that we're all pushing through this best we can. So I've been very encouraged by a lot of what I've seen this week, as hard as the news has gotten. Um, I'm going to pass here to Major, but before I do, I just Major, need to admit to you, I'm, I'm a fan. <laughs> Big fan. And I, I read Roll Deep a uh, number of years ago, and I have never forgotten it. And when I, when I heard that you were going to be joining us, I, I got a little butterfly. So <laughs> I'm so excited that you're here, and I can't wait to get into the absurd man. Um, there's so much in your poetry that I think we need right now, and I'm, I'm so grateful you're joining us. Thank you, John. Thank you. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here with you all and want to uh, thank Sandra for hosting and Kate and Red Hen Press and the Broad Stage. Um, I was uh, I watched last week's program and uh, was a little envious and lo and behold, I get a phone call a couple of days later and happy to be a part of, of this uh, venture. Uh, answer that question. Um, like many, I, I, I'm finding myself watching a lot of YouTube videos uh, that are either coming to me on my feed, um, uh, social media feeds, or people actually emailing me or texting me. Um, and where before I didn't watch uh, uh, cat videos or animal videos, that is hit my, my stream as well. Um, and I'm enjoying it. But um, to answer that question, I am marveling at the, um, the, the amount of artists that want to stay in touch with their own practices and the amount of imagination and innovation that's going into um, maintaining a connection to one's art and one's community and sharing that with the world, which is why I find this to be particularly uh, resonant and exciting to be a part of. Um, I'm also thinking about, just going back to what you were saying, John, about um, people being a little kinder to each other. And, and as you know, I consider this to be one of the big reset buttons uh, for us to realign with each other, uh, to contemplate where we stand, uh, what values um, are meaningful to us, um, to kind of take stock of 
of our connection, not only to each other, but right where we are. And so that's been something that I've been thinking about. And who knew that I would have an occasion to recycle um, uh, an old white t-shirt for a mask I'm about to make. I bought some materials for mask making. So I'll be doing that, that that I'll be doing that tomorrow. Uh, yes, it, this is mine. Uh, we'll go from there. And I think our mask <laughs> skills will reveal something about who we are. And that could be okay. another poem. Um, would you, Major, would you, would you read some poetry for us? Sure, sure. Well, um, as you know, it's uh, difficult. This is, I'm reading from a, a new book called The Absurd Man, which uh, published uh, last month. Um, and just as I was about to launch the book, um, a number of events were rightly uh, canceled for the safety of, of um, for the safety of the public. And so I want to read a few poems from The Absurd Man, and I'll read one poem from my last book, uh, Roll Deep. Um, one of the conceits in this book is the idea of, of the uh, artist and, and the poet and their particular role in society. Um, so I have a, uh, my inner alternate writer self uh, gets uh, some stage time in this book and he kind of reports back to a potential readership about, um, about me. This is something that is now part of our tradition of global poetry, thanks to uh, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, who wrote uh, Borges and I, and I decided to write some poems in that tradition like other poets have. Uh, the title of this poem is called Double Major. I emerge whenever he confuses the lamp for moon. It is then he thinks of fine bindings and ordered Athenaeums. I own his face, but he washes and spends too little time behind his ears. He sees me in the mirror behind thick clouds of shaving cream, then suddenly believes in ghosts. His other cells are murals in the cave of his mind. They are speechless, yet large. They stare his wishes like summer rain and amplify his terrors like newscasters. What he doesn't know, his dreams are his father's dreams, which are his grandfather's dreams and so on. They possess a single wish. He knocks repeatedly on the bolted door to his imagination. Tragically, he believes he can mend his wounds with his poetry and thus I am his most loyal critic. He trots me out like a police dog. He calls our thirst for pads and pencils, destiny. Our voices come together like two wings of a butterfly. On occasion, he closes his eyes and sees me, I am, negative capability, the test to all men are created equal. We are likely to dance at weddings against my will. He pulled out the same moves writing this poem, a smooth shimmy and a hop. This page is a kind of looking glass, making strange whatever stone carvings he installed along the narrow road to his interior. I suffer in silence, wed it to his convictions. He would like to tell you the truth about love, but we are going to bed, to bed. Um, as we know, Florida has been in the news lately, um, and I understand why people do not want to leave beaches. Um, I have a special relationship to, the, uh, to a certain coast in Florida. This is called on Cocoa Beach. I am revisiting the idea of Florida, giving my vertebrae a vacation from all the faded bouquets of urine in New York and all the darkened policies of snow in Vermont. I am revisiting the idea of my wife's imperial gaze. Her three cheese quiche and fluted mimosas are the masters of my mornings. I am revisiting the idea of lawn furniture. By late afternoon on Sunday, my face blossoms like a passion of lilies as I admire the spectral grace of the sandhill crane 
or I'm caught lost thinking of Castillo de San Marcos and the first people Temaqua. I am revisiting the idea of light and laughter and skin half transported by wind. I like to think of myself beside the crepe myrtle, pondering the logos of palm leaves and the kindnesses of beaches. You can have your sororities of pain and darkened subways. I will give myself to the great battles of clouds and surfs. I think um, part of what makes this moment quite special um, for us is that uh, we are uh, we are away from a textured life outside of our homes that um, have impressions on us. And I think part of what makes reading and um, literature and art and music of immense consequence right now is that it has the possibility of, of reminding us of uh, putting us in touch with the world outside our homes. <clears throat> now that you are here, I can think. What you really are is felt, the mainland of your feelings, a young Veronica Webb, and what we share are solutions and not so much the Parisian air you tired of, nor the fat sweaty bead coursing a decolletage, an unlikely consequence of the Kyoto Protocol, but the pleasures of lounging below French style windows, open wide as arms whose blousy curtain is a shawl that formally hangs and informally shifts when you walk into the room like a spike lead dolly shot. The kids are dancing to some Ariana, but I'm watching what you do with your lips when reading silently around 4.22 PM on a late Sunday afternoon. I have a weakness for marble winding stairs and tight two-person elevators, but the brasseries are waiting, as well as the football fans who need help cheering, for we are Americans after all and are ready to hype even the locusts on the day of judgment. I don't care about the midfielder or the winger. You're smiling, and that's all the defending I'll ever need. If you're just joining us, this is the Red Hen Press Poetry Hour, and that was Major Jackson just reading. This is part of the Broad Stage's new series, The Broad Stage at Home. I'm your host, Sandra Singlow, with my bandana and apocalypse here. And we're streaming to you now via Facebook Live, and we have some friends joining us. I'm just giving a shout out to Madge Stein Woods, Roseanne Ziering, Candace Jensen says, yes, Major. Marsha Grounds Whitcomb, Rita Azar says, this is fun. Oleg wow. Kagan is, uh, saw the email earlier and is going to listen while baking banana bread. We do need those breads in this time. Randy Lewis and Danette Christina are sipping extra dry Spanish cava as they sequester with us. Jennifer Hahn is here, Liz Jessup. Toby Harper says hello. Lauren Pizer Mains, uh, thank you for bringing light to my evening. We have been in total quarantine. Uh, hi, Elon. Grace Singh Smith has been so absorbed. Grace burned a chapati. That's absorbed. <laughs> and Preeti Vankani is laughing at the burnt chapati, but totally felt the same way. So if I, I can, I'd like to ask you a few questions, Major, if I can. And um, in a typical pandemic moment, I mentioned Hi, Red Snowstone. I mentioned a publisher and I suddenly went, best publisher in the world, anxiously, <laughs> because I think you have a book that came out last month in February. I have a book that's coming out the same publisher in June. Mm -hmm. And so now we're kind of seeing as book tours like fall apart. So I, I just was so anxious for my publisher that I gave a shout out. But of course, the best publisher in the world is Red Hand Press. <laughs> well, let's say that again. <laughs> Red Hand Press. But I, I think it, it's an interesting time because your book has come out, but it's kind of The Absurd Man, your fifth book of poetry. Yet you know, It's inspired by Camus, which is kind of oddly telling in this time. And I wondered if you could talk about what poetry means for you in these times. In specifically, I was thinking about this March 27th post you did on Facebook to some of your poetry graduate students. I think at NYU, mm -hmm. you used to go on Tuesdays and now 
you can't. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit about what you thought in that? Yeah, sure. I, I think I was, um, well, on that particular day, I, um, as you can imagine, there are a number of people who are experiencing um, immense art hardship, um, either through isolation or um, um, maybe even more dreadfully, the loss of, of someone close to them. And it occurred to me that for poets, what we don't talk about is how we grow um, outside of the craft. And I think one of the areas in which um, poets do that, you know, poetry often emerges as this kind of space where we're able to give voice to that, um, that inner self or our, our inner feelings or what we think. And it's a great discovery for a young person to um, have that outlet in their lives. Um, but as adults, we start taking on, uh, we suddenly realize that our work has deep, deep meaning for those who struggle to find language that um, may articulate what they're feeling or what they're going through. And somehow what I was encouraging my students to do, which has been what been the drum that I've been banging for a couple of years now, which is we need to imagine uh, uh, someone outside of our lives who might encounter our work and make use of those words. And when you start realizing the import of art from that particular angle, you're humble by your calling. And, and that's what I was, that's what I was trying to do and give them some solace as well, because many of them were inquiring, what is this, what am I doing at this particular hour? Is this some kind of indulgence? And I needed to reassure them that they are just as important at the, maybe even more so. Um, presently. Yeah, and I, I think there's something about, you know, coming up in the quote unquote creative class and artists and their egos and what we should be doing and where, you know, how many books do I have out, et cetera. But mm -hmm. I think you said these are the times that call our art and talent into spiritual service and love. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. like, it, it just really <laughs> hit, it hit me, you know, when I'm like, yeah. what about me? Like, it's kind of like, oh no, it's kind of like, oh my gosh, that's so transformative. I think what you're yeah. actually saying and what we're being called to do. And I yeah. am just so taken with the idea where you said um, that you, you're writing not just for the community you know, but for those you can't imagine, those you can't mm -hmm. see. And so I'm thinking mm -hmm. what we're doing right now is you're talking to people out there that, you can't see, I, I think you called it kind of like a global coffee house of a future. <laughs> so, you know, so the virtual book tour may be really the fantastic book tour, I, we hope. Yeah, reach. yeah. Well, you know, it's it, it means also a certain level of, of generosity. I mean, I come out of a, a tradition of writing poetry of protest and a poetry of social vision. Um, I don't believe that that all poems need to occupy that space. Even the most experimental poems can suddenly have a certain kind of, of, of resonance. But it does mean that somehow we are kind of tuned into the moment. And that's that's what I think poets need to need to do is suddenly um, look up and see what's happening uh, around them and to uh, address it. Um, either directly or indirectly, but the poem becomes a certain kind of laboratory and the result and what results out of that can be of enormous import in our world. Well, and I think you've ruminated that poetry, it doesn't have to be nonfiction, what you feel exactly. It can also mm -hmm. have fiction and invention and fantasy in it. And I think reading some of your poems and just the, the time that we're in now, sometimes moments of the day can seem so surreal <laughs> mm -hmm. like, like the sunlight mm -hmm. so bright the dog is you know your senses are heightened and i'm yeah. reading your poetry just uh you know so extraordinary for this time um so and so in the absurd man this is inspired by camus myth of sisyphus here you envision the poet as an absurd hero mm -hmm. Can you explain? yeah well I think, um, and this is a kind of a, 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 a loose uh, frame into the book, but I, at some point in writing it, I, I was contemplating um, 
and well, I was reading Camus and to return to Camus writing and um, including the plague, which is a very interesting book to read during this particular time, because what he um, what he imagines is a, is a society that suddenly is faced with a pandemic and there's an outpouring of community. But then at the end of that particular novel, we go back to our kind of private lives, um, our, um, our tribalisms, and um, we're not as kind. And so my hope is that um, to some extent, if you read that book, you understand the, the, the uh, irony of it. But in reading The Myth of Sisyphus, um, by necessity, because um, Camus asked the question, um, what, is, what is the meaning of it all? And how have various, he gives this portrait of, of several people, iconic figures in society. Um, how do they address the apparently apparent meaninglessness of existence? And it's interesting, it occurred to me that artists, writers, and poets ask that question in various ways. Um, and where they arrive becomes a, a certain kind of of gift towards society, even after they, to quote Robert Frost, even after that momentary stay of confusion and we're back in the chaos, we're back at the bottom of the mountain like Sisyphus starting over again. Without, with new poems, you know, we have to write the new poem. So it occurred to me that there's something heroic about being an artist um, in society and about being a writer and definitely about being a, po a poet because those epiphanies are, um, they're not in abundance. Um, we grow in our wisdom and we hope that someone on the other side, um, again, finds import in our, um, in our discoveries. But, you know, away from the page, we are, um, we're like the everyday man who is going through his life and hopefully making, uh, not only making meaning, but also making the worth of their existence. So, that idea is the underlay, the underpinning to a number of the poems in the book. So timely. <laughs> it's extraordinary. I'm sure you had no idea when you started writing it that this would be here, but that's that's so timely. Um, These are third times indeed. Yeah, so the book, the new book just came out, I believe, February 25th, and you mm -hmm. all have much time at home to read. It, by Major Jackson, it is um, The Absurd Man, available wherever books are sold. And the poetry is extraordinary. Um, and um, we're happy to have you. Um, and, uh, and, I, with, and I think your hair looks amazing. My hair looks <laughs> looks like, <laughs> you're still uh, holding it you together. You should see back there, the edges, <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> so you can't get to your hair cutter in New York. I know that's no, that that's right. <laughs> um, okay, well, thank you. I hope that you'll stay with us. We're going to go to the second half now sure. um, of the show, um, Act Two, if you will, with our other poets live and on video. If you're just joining us, this is the Red Hen Press Poetry Hour from the Broad Stage at Home. I'm your host, Sandra Singlo, and we're streaming on Facebook Live, so feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section. Uh, just Red Snowstone said, yay, poetry. Yes. Connie Post is here. Maddie Lane Glasgow. Hey, girl. Hey, this is fabulous. Uh, Rita agrees that artists can express what we feel. So as artists, I know many are so just feeling, you know, depleted. And, and I think that we need artists to create. So a little less CNN, go to wherever you can, where the squirrels are just shaking their trees all day. The squirrels seem really happy and please make art. Um, and Candace Jensen is, it's very late in, in uh, Vermont, but she is, she thanks Major for being so heroic and Hello, Patty Mills. Thanks for being here. Okay. Next, we have a what we like to call a poetry home video, this time from the lovely uh, and talented, why I said that, it's like the brilliant, well, Felicia Zamora, the brilliant Felicia, thank you. Hi, I'm poet and author Felicia Zamora, reading from my manuscript, Body of Render, which is coming out on April 21st, 2020 from Red Hen Press. 
election night. Tonight, electoral, electoral, electoral. Dichotomy of blue and red. How my Latina body, my pinkish vagina, my nipples protrude just so. How blue my lips after blowjob. How blue my veins and loyal pump to heart. How nasty woman me. How proud. And the nation teeters on a razor, ready to bleed red, 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 my pupils in stun for a president who believes me a disgusting animal. How numbers tally and tally and panic seeds in my chest, my mind traumas, shit, shit. Inauguration, ladies. The president finds you all beautiful pieces of ass. Love Bold. When first you learned other, you a target of slurs and fingers of small fists in shove. Other always, always lives internal. Other bunks in between each disc in your vertebral column, each gland you salivate from, each constriction of pupil in search of understanding. Other finds home in tendrils of brain, safe behind skull. Think walls, think what walls keep, what walls inhibit. How you know, prisoner, and thus out, out, brave other, into a world that throws stones, a world that beats and batters, and you, other, love bold, love bold. This poem is for us, America, this year, the election year. Rise. To all my brothers and sisters of color, rise. To my gay, trans, queer soulmates, rise. To all my nasty women, rise. To the immigrants who make this nation great, rise. Alone is not us, rise. Degradation, not our destiny, rise. Hateful slander and tear at our children's ears, tear our hearts, remain feeble to our strength, rise. Not alone, 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 not a singular voice left unattended. Rise, yes, rise. Thank you. You can find more about me at FeliciaZamora.com and also at Red Hen Pressed to find Body of Render available in April 2020. Thank you. To find Body of Render. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Michelle C. Diamond says, and I think it's a good point, we need a snap button. So broad stage, take that under advisement. Um, thank you so much, Felicia. And next up, we go live to Kate Coles. Wonderful evening this is, thank you so much for this. What a wonderful evening this has been so far. Mark Strand said that poetry tells us in so many words exactly where we are. And this remains true even as where we are changes. My father died at 90 in February and an Emily Dickinson poem took me at that time very hard. And it kept with me as we moved into this current catastrophe. The thing about poetry is that it moves as we move. So I'd like to start with that Dickinson poem. To be alive is power. Existence in itself, 
without a further function, omnipotence enough to be alive and will, tis able as a God, the maker of ourselves be what such being finitude. So I'm going to um, read four little poems from uh, my new red handbook, Wayward, uh, with its beautiful cover. And then I'm going to end with uh, a short, much newer poem. This is Canis Solicitor, or Dog Worrying a Bone. Make room for doubt. Dig and roll in the cool hollow and snooze. Dig some more. Find a bone you buried last year or before, then forgot. Believe you have no past or future, no idea. Chew and gnaw and worry what if you're the hard core of everything. What might be wrong hold together. The new day enters in the heroic mode, feathered and helmeted, muscle bounded for glory, smelling of scorch. Raise that sword a little higher if you can lift it and buckle your straps tight. Insert fanfare. Nobody still gets to ride the train all afternoon, dozing. Scotch that clickety clack, the sudden dark plunge. In the underworld, nobody gets to be just a body anymore, ripe, a little bloody, and needing its toenails clipped. Me, poor me. I'm steeping in juices, greased and gristled. In the past, I've been pretty enough, though, to make up for anything. From space. You are smaller than I remember, and so is the house, set downhill afloat in a sea of scrub oak. From up here, it's an ordinary box with gravel spread over its lid, waiting it but inside it's full of shadows and sky. Clouds pull themselves over dry grass, which, if I'm not mistaken, will erupt any minute in flame. Only a spark, a sunbeam focused. From up here, enjoying the view, I can finally take you in. Will you wave back? I keep slingshotting around. There's gravity for you. But all I ever wanted was to fly. No end to happiness, no end to woe. No way to know which weighs more. Today, bliss carries my small boat, turning oars lost already miles upstream. Bliss, a word we're barely allowed these days to use. Now the boat spins, sky flashes blue through leaves, where a pureol lofts its song, pure gold on the air. The air, a faint trembling, downstream could be anywhere. So Wayward is uh, kind of an, in, uh, an innocent book, or it feels like an innocent book uh, in this particular moment. Um, this is a poem that I wrote before the catastrophe was upon us, but when it was just beginning to make itself visible over the horizon. It's called Deluge for K. The things we most fear we bring on. Your locked cell, my failure of heart. Once we each turned and saw a door we hadn't noticed opening into some other life and forgot to expect catastrophe until it befell the people standing beside us. A sister we can't help escape her locked cell, a brother's downheartedness rising as rage, cold and dark, thinking it should have been me. I remember so long ago we sat on a bluff smoking, the road below flowing with water. We could not escape or anyone reach us, blue sky after storm, food to last a day. I have never feared water, have you? How happy we were in sunlight, right where we were, unsaved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you, Kate Coles.
If you're just joining us, this is the Red Hand Press Poetry Hour, part of the Broad Stage's new series, The Broad Stage at Home. We're streaming live on Facebook, so feel free to comment since we can give you a shout out. Uh, Shyla Sheehan says, wonderful. Kate Coles, thank you. Liz Camfjord says, what a discovery. We can just only hope that Oleg's banana bread is done by now, that Grace has new unburnt chapati, and that Randy Lewis and Danette Christine are tucking into their second bottle of very dry combo. All right, so now we have Blank Verse Films, founded by Mike Joya. Blank Verse creates unique poetry-related films, all free and on YouTube. Check them out, Blank Verse. Here's an incredible film inspired by the poem Dear Mr. K by Ron Kirchie. I get a lot of letters from fans, especially high school and middle school students. And this poem, Dear Mr. K, is about one of those letters. Dear Mr. K, the reason I am writing is I keep seeing deeper meanings in your poems but my friends say there's nothing there. In that one poem, will you go to the racetrack? I think the rain stands for something, but everybody says it's just rain. You can settle things if you are kind and want to write back. I saw your picture somewhere online, and you look kind for an older, old person. Do you do anything special to not look as old as you might look if you didn't do anything? Like a vitamin, maybe? I showed my father your poems, and he said, What? See, that's an example of something my teacher calls compression, meaning a lot, without saying a lot. <laughs> your poems are not very compressed. They are all over the place. They sprawl on the page, like lazy cats. Do you like that simile? I sort of learned that from you. Okay, I agree with my father and nobody makes similes for a living. Or maybe I'm wrong. How much do you make per year? Or even per month? Or even per simile? If that's too nosy, pretend I didn't ask. I like you as a poet. You're simple to read compared to famous poets. I showed my mother your poems, too. She laughed, but not at the funny ones. Write back, okay? Soon, if you can. My grandfather looked pretty good, like you do, but he died in church, sitting up. Well, that's all for now. It's raining outside. If I was a poet, it would probably stand for something, but I'm not. So it's just rain. Thank you, Amelia Franco. Ah, uh, Ron. <laughs> You know what? And, and, you know, the track, the race track, we've, we've been there with them. What hilarious. And, and uh, Chris Carmen laughs, Rita Azar laughs, Patty Mills. And I think anybody who's a poet or writer or artist of any kind can, can relate. Oh, Ron, thank you. Uh, and next up we have Dee Dee Jackson. Hi. Hi. It's, um, great to be a part of this. I'll be reading from uh, my book that also um, was to be released or will be released April 21st from Red Hen Press. I'll read two poems from Moon Jar um, and then one new poem. Um, and the first poem I'm going to read, I lived in Florida for 40 years. I live in Vermont now. Um, but grew up in Florida. So Florida is also near and dear to me. And all of my family um, are, are there and many of my friends so um, are still there. And I'm watching 
on the map that the New York Times puts up, I'm watching Florida just explode in red now. I think they're up to 12,000 cases. So this poem was written after a visit to New Smyrna Beach, Florida, which is where my mom and um, husband Bob currently live. Even the ocean's relentless roar can be a kind of wail. The stars above the breakers, tiny archipelagos of agony. I can grieve here or in the north. At dawn, crows gather at the ocean's edge. Such a contrast to the day's white gulls, who, papery and weightless, hover above the whimper and moan of the shoreline. I don't like to write about the ocean. It reveals its emotions too easily. But here I am, closer to the place of your death than I prefer to be. It rains every afternoon. The thunderheads build like ashy skyscrapers. The ocean litters its shores with its dead that visitors collect in buckets and pockets and carry home. I never buried you. Instead, I gave the urn to your family. You believed in no God. I believe in the clockwork of waves. Still do, I guess. Hoping they somehow will hurry time. Or at least for now, definite. My next poem is a poem I wrote years ago, but today is my son's birthday. He is 22 today, and I'm thinking about how difficult that is in, in where we are now. And, and um, you know, this juxtaposing of celebrating a birth and someone's birth in this time. I had a student who turned 20 a few days ago, and my son turned 22 today, so this poem is titled Directions from My Son on his birthday. So happy birthday, Dylan. I cut my hands to hold your youth. I try to show you how to do the same. It takes decades of practice to get this right. And by then, it is always too late. Yesterday, a man stabbed a homeless man on Church Street. At dinner, we tuck this story between bites of salmon, pieces of song by Fleetwood Mac, melting from the speaker. It rained all day today. I told you that I always thought I'd have another baby. In truth, I knew I was only good for one. No matter how hard you press the outer edges of your palms and pinkies together, they will always leak. You should know that you can't hold water in your palm for long. Don't put yourself in a spot where you have to carry all you will need. At dusk, we count four rabbits on the back lawn, and I consider if it is a sign only to watch the stocking feral tabby turn them to humble bronze, heavy and frozen and hopefully downwind. At least once a year, you should close your cupped hands like a book. Not to worry, hinged, they always open again. My last poem is a poem that I wrote. I know I've heard um, many of my friends say it's really difficult right now to write, but um, this came pretty easily to, for me, and I hope it has a message of, of hope and, um, and for what we have in our future. So it's titled Ides of March. I did write it on the Ides of March. March has a whole new meaning now. Two doves land in the moss below the feeder, sunbathe in the last light of the spring day, then huddle on a lower branch of the ancient hackberry tree where we wait to see them mate. By today, the newest plague has killed over 10,000 in Italy. So any life is good life. The 2016 Liberti Dolba, although not communion, feels sacred, as does our crackers and cheese, our hike under a biblically blue sky, our fire raging in its cage when we return home. 
I've complained about so much for so often. So how now do I love that tiny fellow chipmunk who, on his hind legs, checks the celestial movement of the sun before digging what I imagine to be the Christian catacombs under our foundation? He has a mission. So should I. So should we all. Do I believe in knowledge as I know it? But what about all I forget? No rain today fell into open graves of the dead, only a sunset and life as we know it. Thank you. Dee Dee, of your many fans, Michelle Dershimer feels that she is your biggest fan and Georgina Marie is tuning in from Northern California and is also it is also a fan as are, are we all and to your son dylan that's an aries birthday i had a child just turned 18 last week you can imagine how festive that was so i think governor newsom has decreed all aries get two birthday cakes and they can both be chocolate so shout out to dylan happy birthday um and now we go to douglas kearney Um, out here, yeah, I'm reporting from St. Paul. Um, it's a pleasure to hear from Major Felicia, Kate, Ron, and Didi. And uh, thank you, Sandra, for hosting. I'm just gonna do three poems. Um, the first one is, I've been working on and off on a series of poems about Prince's hair as seen in his music videos. And I'd like to start tonight with one based on his apocalyptic party jam, 1999, in which he rocked this kind of feathery jerry curl. Now there's a moment in the video at about one minute and 10 seconds in where it looks like someone is holding a lock of it. It sticks out kind of stiff and frozen before snapping into place and he turns his head. 1999. From the first out of time, out of turn to lock eyes, prior cut to the crash, this cut from what must have was stuck as a pause would have hung laying side, long just juts like an antler or plume. Uh, Jerry, cockatoo, uh, shiny, peekaboo, out of time, then in time, activated, asp, struck, coy, coil, lash, brow like his edges ain't scraped, black curl, curled back to his cheek, ran it back, I run back, run it back, out of time, back on locks, slick that bounce, so they go and go back to what must have, I can't see it, stuck, then it turned, ran it back, and he go, and it bounce, run it back, and I see how it's cut, he been out, but I look how he look, like he's still fixing to move, but he stopped. This next poem is uh, called Sandfire or the Pool 2016. And it's actually um, in the great tradition of Los Angeles based forms. It's a sequel um, to a poem uh, called The Pool 1988, which was published in a collection called Patter um, by Red Hand Press um, in 2014. And uh, it's referencing the Sandfire, which is one of the big fires we had in Southern California in 2016. There's a mention of a metformin, which is a drug for diabetes. Sandfire or the pool, 2016. Chlorine and smoke lit our eyes. Since it was, we swam while fire made a boxer's ear of sky. Sweet, let go the side. You'll be fine. You dove your violet ring from deepest cool. Let me worry while my carol blood slick guts just how it is now. Know how far the burning by, how small those first responders fly at soot bruised afternoon skin. My guts crack slick knuckles, met form and putting work in deep. Your hitch at how'd it start? I've told you yellow weather lights the litter. Oil spatters, common salt wart. Don't breathe outside for days. Copters ring around and spill to slow the flower you goggle water and what fire's gonna eat eat sweet yes oh though not ours this time because let me worry over burning over drowning how molasses blood loiters how we go below what just happens hold your breath and deeper deeper then until you daughter daughter come up clutching what is under come back striking what's above and i'm gonna end with a new poem um you know, a lot of people were sort of astonished and aghast um, when uh, Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick 
suggested that we trade people for profits. Um, and um, this is the United States of America, y'all. Close for my family. The funk recall as most of black shit once was and is sickness. Fool, how much oogie up in your GB? Our black asses been hunkered in our house in now transitional hood. We steal away here was once called white cliffs. Fool, how much me up in your pa? Baby girl coughing, but it's been wet. So she stay singing what pops. We spit out the house kitchen, bags up of chicken, bags up of chicken bones to that rank bin in the alley till no lick of soup shadows. It smells close, says N, for funky. Sure, with winter's steady eavesdropping, Tom peeping five months near. Ma's tinctures smell foodish, but go on skin. Sent the mix. Fool, how much acai up in your argan? What you can't eat off love, even out brown hands, then I must to market. Once my son came, pulled kale, milk, cereals, but now must set home in his blossom of must there where we close. I gape eyes long stripped aisles, tend my gap between strained neighbors, drill my recall at what have I touched, plot where I can wash next hands what stay on ashes, ashes, fool how much cocoa up in your shay. I come back dank as home, them bleach wipes on our porch. We keep a sickness out. Thank you. Doug Kearney, thank you so much. Um, again, of your many fans, Nina Rota is giving you a shout out and Red Snowstone says, saying, hey, from Iowa City. Incredible, thank you so much. Um, do we have, before we turn to our last poet, do we have our panel for a moment to give any last thoughts? Yes, there they are. Okay. How about Kate, Rob, and Major in that order? Oh, that was just amazing. All of that poetry was just amazing. Um, but that last one is just kind of vibrating in the air there. Um, but all of that was just amazing. Yes, Rob. Oh, my gosh. I, I'm so captivated by... Also, especially tonight, like the, the the musicianship of these poets tonight was really amazing. You know, yeah. it's, it's a way that I respond to it, but wow, just listening to the profound control of, of musical elements in all of them, especially in, in Douglas, just just crazy. So I, I really enjoyed hearing it and what everyone had to say just felt, you know, just timely, profound and necessary, Re really lovely. Yeah, I, I equally feel enriched by this evening. Every person, uh, well, first of all, just the range is just a beautiful kind of statement of the the uh, wealth of poetry that's being written and published. And kudos to uh, Red Hen and um, and you know Doug kind of reminds us. You know, we may be locked in our particular home cells, but we are living in a democracy, and we have to realize that and uh, and uh, treasure and understand the challenge of that as we um, deal with this pandemic. It's pretty, pretty, pretty amazing from all those poets, for sure. And um, Oleg Kagan was really inspired, Major, by your comments on the role of poets and artists. I think that those mm -hmm. words have been so resonant right now when we feel kind of helpless. Mm -hmm. Um, and also his banana bread is going to be ready in about 30 minutes. So if he's anywhere near Vermont, he could deliver to you. <laughs> well, then, frankly, I wish my birthday was in April so I could have two, <laughs> with two chocolate cakes. Every, everybody gets two cakes. And Maddie Lane Glasgow, it's just four flames. And um, as we go to our last poet, we're going to, uh, Patty Mills says, hey, um, to Francesca Bell. And Mason Bryant says, woot, woot, go, Francesca. Thanks to our panel. And now to our last poet, Francesca.
Good evening, everyone. And thank you all for letting us into your homes with our poems. Thank you for all the other poets tonight and to Red Hand Press and to the Broad Stage for making all of this possible and for including me. And I'm going to start tonight by reading a poem that's for my mother. I wrote it for her many years ago. Uh, my mother has been going deaf since I was a little girl. And um, the poignance of that has been increased by the fact that I am also now losing my hearing. And um, she and I both have hearing aids now. Making you noise for my mother. The day before you go deaf completely, I will make you noise. I will bring birds, bracelets, chimes to hang in wind. We will drive from Idaho to Washington again, and I will read to keep you awake. I will tap little poems on the backs of your arms and neck to be sure you hear me. I will place spoons on your body in restaurants, smack my lips, heave you sighs, each one deeper than the last. We will finally shout. And then, as quiet slips in, settling over, I will speak. I will keep speaking. I will sing you nonsense songs until you sleep. And my other two poems um, all have to do, or both have to do with the pandemic. And this first pandemic poem is going out to Governor DeSantis of Florida. I wrote it in um, a state of great frustration a couple of weeks ago, seeing all of the young people cavorting on the Florida beaches during spring break. And this poem's title is its first line. While sheltering, I hold on to the small physical tasks of the everyday as if they are railings on either side of a steep staircase. I sweep and mop, do my dishes while the markets collapse and my country just stands in the middle of the tracks with a train approaching, its slow weight making the steel tremble before it. On Florida's beaches, college students frolic, sun glinting crazily off youth they wear like a crown. Their beautiful bodies teem with possibility as life rises like a tide in them, and also in the virus that proliferates madly as they fuck each other, salty and senseless, in tacky hotel rooms. They don't yet care that dying of pneumonia is like swimming out too far, then slowly succumbing, drunken from lack of oxygen. They do not recognize that these are boom times in the valley of death and that they, with their greedy insistence, are vectors, carriers, his gorgeous golden emissaries. And this last poem um, is a love poem. Uh, it's for my husband and um, I've, I want to reassure everyone because my husband has been worried about this, that my husband is not an asshole. I wrote this poem out of my great deep love for him. Love in the time of COVID-19 for my husband, 21 years my senior. There are so many times I could have killed you. After 28 years of marriage, the only contact sport I've ever stuck with. I found myself crying this morning after a trip outside, singing happy birthday three times through, just to be sure. Scrubbing despite the sting of my split skin, as I've loved you through even the rub of the raw years. I held my hand steady in the water's reassuring scald, trying and trying to save you. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay home and stay safe. Good night.
Thank you, Francesca. Yeah, so extraordinary. Chris Carmen says so personal and touching. Connie Post, go Francesca. Leslie Hoffman, a, a fan of yours and enjoying all the beautiful poets that she's been introduced to tonight. And Madge Stein Wood says you got it right about DeSantis. So that wraps up this edition of the Red Hen Press Poetry Hour brought to you by The Broad at Home. Uh, Chris Carmen also says regarding Ron Kirchie's point, how much do poets make? Surely not enough. And so that's why we'll have Randy and Danette on the other end who will be inviting everyone to dinner if that can never be allowed again and the Cabo will flow. So be sure to follow Red Hen Press and The Broad Stage on all social media. And you know, Red Hand Press has so many extraordinary books. You can go to their website at redhandpress.org and just see all the incredible work that, that, that they've published over the years and continue to. And um, be sure to tune in tomorrow, Sunday at 11 a.m. for Broad Stage Music Mornings, right here on Broad Stage Facebook Live. Lynn Harrell and Lucio Maccarelli. And join us, Red Hand Press Poetry Hour, next week, Saturday at 8, when our featured poet will be Richard Blanco. Stay safe, sane and soapy. Um, be well, be safe. I'm Sandra Tsinglo. Good night. <laughs>